Well, um, this morning I want to share with you a message that I haven't preached it much. I've done it a couple times. It's a newer uh, message, but it, it's, I think, a relevant and timely message for the season of history in which we're living. Um, this sermon is called The Anatomy of Unbelief, What Really Happened in Nazareth. And I don't think we spend much time thinking about the story of Jesus and his return to his hometown at the commencement of his ministry. But um, there's a lot of information given to us in the scripture. And to get it, you, you kind of need to stop a bit, slow down, understand what's happening in the story. But the scriptures actually give us two accounts, one in Mark and one in Luke. We're going to read both of them this morning because we won't capture the full impact of what's going on if we don't read these two stories side by side. Now, um, among people who are kind of wonkish and theologically inclined, uh, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. You don't tend to use that in normal conversation, but it means meant to be read alongside of one another or read together. <clears throat> and I don't think you get the whole impact of the story without reading both. So we're going to do that on the front end in just one moment, um, and that will give us uh, a launch pad for understanding Nazareth and what it tells us about our world and us today. So the first passage is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. And the backstory to Mark 6 is, I'm not going to read the backstory, I'm just going to give it to you, is that um, in Mark 5, uh, Jesus actually has gone and raised a little girl from the dead. And when he does this, he, he takes with him Peter and James and John and the parents of the little girl. Everyone else is laughing at him. They're, they're, they, think he's, they think he's an idiot because when he comes to pray for this little girl to raise her from the dead, he says, don't be afraid, she's just asleep. And they think he's an idiot, a buffoon, because even in ancient times, people knew what a dead person looked like. And they had their own ways of testing if people were dead. One of the most common was you'd get something sharp and poke them and see if they moved. Or they might get a piece of cold metal or a mirror and put it under their nose and see if there was breath. Nowadays, we use really scientific stuff like whether they're brain dead. By the way, I have a friend who was pronounced brain dead in New Jersey uh, roughly a month ago. I don't know the exact day count now, but anyway, um, he's off the vent. All of his systems are functioning, and he's alive. He's not brain dead. Unfortunately, he's still in a coma, so we're praying him out of the coma. But uh, I, I say that just to say that all of our uh, sophisticated techniques of modernity may not always be everything we think they are. So anyway, Jesus had gone to raise this little girl from the dead, and what he had done when he brought Peter and Andrew, excuse me, Peter and James and John, not Andrew, uh, Peter and James and John and the parents with him into the room where he raises this little girl from the dead, what he had done was he had created what I, this, this is not in the Bible, but I'm going to call it a microclimate of faith. He would created a little bubble of belief where miracles could thrive. And so he raises this girl from the dead, and, uh, and it says, uh, 542, and immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Now, amazement's an interesting word. It, it, it means that something you didn't expect to happen happened, and you're overcome with a sense of awe. Could be, you could begin crying. Uh, but you, you're beside yourself. You, know, you don't even know what to do, really. And then it goes on, and it says in Mark uh, 6.1, which is our passage, or the first of two, and he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. So he's just had a dramatic miracle. He's raised a child from the dead, and he goes home. And when he gets to his hometown, the Scripture tells us, and on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? 
and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there. He could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief and he went about among the villages teaching. So he's come from a great time of breakthrough and favor, although it didn't start his favor. He'd, he'd run into a wall of unbelief when he went to pray for Jairus' daughter. And now he's hitting a new wall of unbelief. Only this one is among his friends and his family. Nobody can quite sort out what's going on here with Jesus, but something has changed. Now, the other account of Jesus in his hometown comes in Luke chapter 4, and um, we're going to start looking at verse 16, and it says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth and they said isn't this joseph's son now that sounds like the mark passage we read except it in the mark passage they said isn't he just a carpenter the son of a carpenter and he said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard that you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over the whole land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, but none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff but passing through their midst, he went away. Well, this is the word of the Lord. And what do we do with these stories that stand side by side? Not long ago, earlier in uh, uh, 2023, um, I was talking with a friend about the differential in anointing that exists between the U.S. and other countries. Barb, where'd you go? There. Um, so you and where's Tom? He sat down somewhere. Yeah. You guys, I mean, you guys know what this is or you're going to. You, you go to other lands and suddenly the anointing just like goes through the roof. You might actually raise the dead, Tom. Go over there expecting to do it. Yeah. Go over there expecting to do it. And so um, we were talking about that phenomenon. Now, this particular friend of mine has traveled with uh, someone with whom I associate often and who is known for healings and miracles in his ministry. And um, this friend was saying, so why is it that we don't really see that as much in the US? And I said, well, it's because of the Nazareth factor. And what do you mean by that? So the context of that conversation was a particular kind of outreach that was going to be uh, carried out in the hometown here in the US. And so the, the, the question that was put on the table, so to speak, we were having dinner, so it literally was on the table. Uh, the question that was put on the table was, are we going to experience a U.S. level of anointing or an international level of anointing? 
And for the purposes of what we're doing right now, it doesn't matter what country we're talking about. It could be Zambia, it could be Indonesia, it could be Mexico. It doesn't really matter. The point is it's not here. And so it was actually, I thought, a fair question because anyone who travels in ministry knows that this differential exists. You might experience a greater level of anointing on the playa at Burning Man than you might in downtown Coeur d'Alene or Haiti. So it doesn't need to be even outside the country. It's, it's more a shift of context. And a lot of people bump into it and they kind of scratch their head over it, don't really know what to do with it, and they kind of move on. So what actually happened in Nazareth? Well, Jesus was following the principle of honor. He returned to his hometown. Now, we know the basic story of Jesus. He'd gone to John's revival. He'd been baptized in the Jordan River. The Spirit of God had descended on him like a dove. And after 40 days in the wilderness, he returned, as it says, in the power of the Spirit, and things start happening all around him. But he hadn't made it back to Nazareth yet. And so after this tremendous resurrection in Nain, which appears to be early in his um, in his ministry career, he goes back to his hometown to honor his own people. And when he does, he brings them a prophetic word. Now, the thing that's interesting about it is he doesn't do what you might expect today, what many would expect, which is that when you bring the prophetic word, you stand up and you call someone out or you say, and the Lord would say, he didn't do that. He just opened the scroll of Isaiah and he found a particular passage that evidently was important to him. It was something that maybe the Spirit of God had spoken to him many times about. It was something that he carried within him. It was part of the essential nature of his own calling, which I'm sure in his childhood, his mother and his father, Mary and Joseph, they'd spoken to him about the words of Gabriel and that he would be called Yahashua or Jesus because he would save the people from their sins. He was, if you will, opening his heart to them and saying, I've lived among you for so long, I've gone away now, but I've come back in order to tell you something of why I was born, what, what, what is my mission in life. And so he shares a prophetic word out of the written word. This is as valid of a prophetic word as calling someone out. But I dare say in our modern world as the gift of prophecy and prophetic ministry have developed over the last maybe 30 years or so, um, I think the idea of a word out of the word has been dramatically reduced and people tend to treat that with contempt. Now that's not my main point this morning, but I throw it out there because I think it is a problem and it is something we need to be mindful of. So he shares this written word from them, before them, um, and it was in fact a prophetic word and, and uh, Luke records the passage out of Isaiah 61, and there was same, some amening going on while I was reading it. And then bouncing back into Mark. So you gotta, you got to interpolate between these passages because each of them has something that the other doesn't to, to see the picture of what's going on. He performed some healings. It says he could lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them, but he couldn't do any mighty work. So something about who Jesus was was constrained. There was a, I don't know, not to sound, <laughs> not to sound too highfalutin. There was there was something tangible. There was an existential blockage, even to the Son of God, in that environment. And so what Jesus could do, and all he could do, was to share what he had. Maybe not what they wanted, because what they wanted was a show. Do for us what you did in Capernaum. We've heard about it. Show us what you got, kid. You've been around us for a while. You've never done that before. So if you're really the guy, be the guy. That's kind of the way we might say it in modern street English. And so the people in Nazareth, they recognized him physically. Yep, that's Jesus. We know who he is, all right. But something had changed, and because of them, not because of him, because of them, because of the mindset, because of the attitude, because of the culture of Nazareth itself, they didn't recognize him. They didn't know that something had actually changed since he had gone away to John's revival. 
and had now returned. And we could say it this way, because they thought they knew who he was, their familiarity, I would say it was an inappropriate familiarity, but nevertheless, their familiarity as townspeople from his hometown, it bred contempt. Now, some of you might have some familiarity with this because a lot of you are from this area. I know there's a lot of immigrants, too, from places like California, but, uh, but there's some of you that are you know, natives of this area. And maybe as you've grown up, uh, you've made good. You've grown beyond that person that you were possibly in, say, high school. Um, and you've established yourself and you've grown, and yet people still view you through those old lenses of who you were. And so what they're doing is they are doing something that Paul actually forbids us to do. They were regarding him after the manner of the flesh, according to the fallen mind, according to the, uh, the categories and judgments of a mind that doesn't follow the ways of the spirit. That's what they were doing. And as a result, the scripture says they took offense at him. And they particularly were offended at his allusion to the widow of Zarephath, who lived in what today we would call Lebanon, and also to Naaman the leper, who was a Syrian army commander. And all these lepers are in Israel, none of them gets healed, and yet this Syrian comes and he gets healed. These were stories that stuck in the craw of the people of Jesus' time, because as they read those Old Testament stories, they were like, how can it be? How could it be that Elijah went to Lebanon? And how could it be that this Syrian gets healed? And nobody really knew what to do with it. So after a while, they're like, nah. It's just, it's just old stories in the book. And as a result of all of that, all of those filters, all of that hardness of heart, they failed to understand that the presence and power of God are actually drawn to expectant faith. It's a really important principle of ministry in the spirit. It's a, it's a very important principle in the realm of miracles. Expectant faith is faith that comes expecting God will do something, not show me what you got, kid. I hope you all immediately see the difference and I don't even need to unpack it. We live in a society today that is filled with show me what you got. Oh yeah, we know about the church. Yeah, sure. We'll talk about this more in a second, but... Anyway, that's the world we live in today. Whereas when you go to Zambia, Tom, you're going to have people that are like, oh, you've come in the name of the Lord. If you preach the word of God, God will honor his word and things will happen. And by the way, it's no different in Nigeria or Uganda or India or whatever, because the nature of the world outside of the U.S., a post-Christian society, is that people grab a hold of the word of God, they aren't, they aren't critical of it, they're not analytical of it, they say, surely there must be something true about it. So the people of Nazareth were setting themselves up for failure. And prophets, and I could say other anointed ministers, they might be evangelists or whatever we call them, even pastors in their own home church, uh, Oftentimes, they, uh, they find themselves being disregarded by those who know them or who think they know them or who once knew them in another setting. And that's what's going on with Jesus. They had known him then, but they didn't know him now. They didn't realize the uh, transformation or the upgrade, whatever term you want to use. He was still Jesus but something had happened in that encounter at the river. Something had happened while he was in the wilderness. Something had shifted, and the kingdom of God was now being proclaimed. And so it says that they took offense. Their offense, uh, offense is another word for unbelief. It's not the only form of unbelief. It's a particular kind of unbelief. But their offense, their unbelief, meant that no miracles could occur. And... Um, Right alongside of it is this contempt that they had for him because they thought they knew who he was. So now we have two faces of unbelief, contempt and offense. Unbelief is more than merely I don't believe, although there is for sure that category when people just say, no, nah, I don't believe that. 
I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe the gospel. I don't believe that Jesus stuff. And you can do that if you want to, but you're out of your mind. That's one form of unbelief. But the thing that's interesting about this story is that it actually went down in a synagogue, which means these were church-going folk. Now, there was no church yet. The church gets born on Pentecost. But the synagogue is the precursor to the church. It's the, uh, it's the social device, if you want to say it that way. It's the uh, anthropological gathering of a community of faith in the Old Covenant where they would study the Hebrew scriptures and preach um, that becomes the predecessor the preamble to what we today call the church. And in fact, if you look at Paul's letters, the structure of the church that Paul lays out, uh, what's sometimes called bishops and then presbyters and deacons, even that follows the structure of how the synagogue of the first century worked. So a lot of it gets picked up kind of en bloc and dropped into the modern church. And that's why I say Jesus was talking to church-going folk. So unbelief is... Not merely, I don't believe. It's more along these lines. I can't believe that Jesus, Robbie, Tom, Barb, I can't believe they're doing that here. Who are these people anyway? It's often a mixture, and it's a toxic mixture of it can't be, I don't know how it could be, I don't believe that it could be at all, and there isn't enough for this to be. Now, those four are very important. We'll return to them at the very end of the sermon. But again, it can't be. I don't know how it could be. I don't believe it could be at all, and there isn't enough for this to be. And it says that Jesus himself marveled at their unbelief. Now, it's interesting because they're marveling at him while he's marveling at them. So it was a mutual astonishment, if you want to say it that way. All right, well, this unbelief in Nazareth, because of these four factors that I just described, um, this unbelief in Nazareth is more than simply I'm having a faith crisis or I'm struggling a little bit with whether and when God might come through for me. This is something that gets built up over time, and the term I like to use for it, again, you won't find this in the Bible, but... You know, preachers put tags on things to help people remember what it is. Um, this unbelief was what I call matrixed unbelief. Kind of comes at you this way, comes at you that way, and the, the, the combined effect is far more powerful, and in this case negative and toxic, than a simple, I'm really struggling right now. It interlocked and it fed upon itself. It was more than one single person's problem. It was a town steeped in unbelief and built upon a foundation of dishonor. That's what Nazareth was. And with that, we can uh, discern through these two passages the, that there are three major problems that the people of Nazareth had. Three. Number one, they knew Jesus, they knew his family, and they knew his family history. And so their familiarity with him, as I already su have suggested, it bred contempt, a dismissal of who he was. He had a reputation as, can I use the word bastard from a Sunday pulpit? As the bastard son of a carpenter and his fiance who couldn't control themselves in an era where people didn't have sex before marriage. Today we're kind of like, meh, everybody does it. Eh, they slipped up, it's okay, they'll be married soon. But in ancient times, that was not the case. It was expected that you would keep yourself pure. In fact, the Gospel of Matthew specifically calls out that notwithstanding the fact that Mary was pregnant, Joseph had no union with her until after she had given birth to Jesus. And so what that tells you is he could have gotten away with it. After all, she's already pregnant, but they didn't have any sexual relations until after the birth of Jesus and after their formal proper wedding. So they thought they knew the story. They were sure that he was just, you know, Joseph and Mary couldn't keep their hands off of each other. And, um, and so he had grown up with this reputational taint, this idea that he was a bastard. And uh, with that, and this is really important, 
the people of Nazareth, when they looked at Jesus, when they looked at the entire family, Joseph, Mary, and all the brothers and sisters, they were like, mm hmm we're better than they are. And so that idea of thinking you're better than somebody else, that's right in the center of this kind of a culture of dishonor. Again, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.16, henceforth, we regard no man or woman after the manner of the flesh. But this is what Nazareth had fallen into. And I might add, culturally, similarly, in America today, we think we know Jesus, but we as a nation, as a society, we have actually forgotten who he is. There may be churches on every corner. People may use his name as a swear word. Uh, they might think they know something about Jesus, but you'd be actually surprised. Maybe, maybe not as much here as in, say, my hometown of Los Angeles, but if you ask people, what's the story of Jesus? Do you know who Jesus is, where he came from, what he did? You'd be surprised at how many people know virtually nothing, but they think they know everything because I'm an American, I must be a Christian. And that's what's going on in Nazareth. And so, as with Nazareth, um, where they said, well, he once dwelt among us, and they didn't recognize how things had changed. We as a society in America today no longer know what we think we once knew. And that's part of our unbelief. And um, even for people who attend church, good folk like you, um, this is in the air, it's in the water, it's on the airwaves, it's in our broadcasts, it's in social media, it's everywhere, and we need to be careful lest it become a toxic ingredient in our own spiritual food. Because it is degrading the power and the victory of our modern churches. They don't have this problem, not like this. Not in, they don't have this in Zambia, Tom. When you get there, you're going to see. It's going to be a completely different yeah, ball game. And you're going to come back and go, what in the world? I'd rather go back to Zambia. I'd rather live in a world of faith than live in all the abundance and prosperity I have here, but marked by that unbelief. It is that subtle and that dangerous. All right, number two, um, because of that, uh, the people in Nazareth, they did not honor Jesus. And I said this already, he'd come to honor them, but they didn't reciprocate. Nazareth as a place was a, and a society both, so, uh, you know, a community. Nazareth wasn't a big town, but every gathering of people develops its own kind of social mores and customs, its own subculture. Yes, it was part of wider Jewish society, but there was something unique about Nazareth. And so it was a place in a society with a checkered reputation. And that's why over in the Gospel of John, which we didn't read, in chapter 1, verse 46, um, Philip goes to get Nathanael, and he says, come see him of whom Moses and the prophets wrote. And Nathanael says, well, who are we going to go see? And Philip says, uh, we're going to go see Jesus of Nazareth. And what does Nathanael famously say? Nazareth. Are you kidding me? What good can come out of Nazareth? So it had a reputational taint as a town, as a civilization. Nazareth was something of a hard scrabble little town perched on the edge of a cliff. Remember, it says they were going to throw him off the cliff. And if you've seen The Chosen, you would know that scene where they go to do that with Jesus. It was a hard scrabble little town perched on the edge of a cliff filled with people of no particular repute, rough cut, and perhaps a bit uncouth, vulgar, and coarse. Just a stone's throw, closer than Coeur d'Alene is to Hayden, just a stone's throw away, uh, there was a town called Gath Hefer. It was about two and a half miles, four kilometers, for those who speak metric. And Jonah, the prophet, had come from Gath Hefer. And Jonah was the prophet who had received a calling from God. He'd um, gone to preach in Nineveh, and while he was there, as it turned out, he, as we say sometimes in the missionary community, he'd gone native. He never came home. And we know this because in 2015, when the Islamic State rolled into the town of Mosul, Iraq, which is the modern name of Nineveh, when they came into Mosul, the very, very first thing they did after taking the, the city was they went to the tomb of the prophet Jonah and blew it up. 
They wanted to wipe out all references to Jewish or Christian anything. And so you can, you can see pictures of it. They're, they're postable or posted on the internet. And you can even see the detonation of the explosives that blew up the tomb of the prophet Jonah. But that tomb would not have been there but for the fact that Jonah spent the rest of his life living in Nineveh, ministering to the Ninevites. And as a result of his ministrations, the destruction of, of the Assyrian Empire in the city of Nineveh was held off for about two generations because he preached righteousness to them. And they did actually repent as recorded in the book of Jonah. But Jonah, notwithstanding the good he had done, because of the, the nationalism, because of the parochialism, because of the culture of dishonor that was uh, prevalent back even in Jonah's day, which preceded Jesus by several centuries, um, all of that uh, it, it was just in the area. And so this entire region had a reputational taint. No good can come from that area. And so we get Jonah, we get Jesus, and of course Jesus isn't ashamed to associate with Jonah. He talks about as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of a whale, uh, so also will the Son of Man be three days and nights in, in the earth. Uh, but, but for most of them, they're like, would you please stop with the whole Jonah thing? We just can't go there. And because of all of this, this culture, this history, this social construct, the people, as Jesus is speaking, it says they marveled at the gracious words coming out of his mouth. What they're really saying is, well, we expect him to be like us, filled with cynicism, filled with that kind of ambivalence, that sort of, yeah, show me what you got. I'm from Missouri, the show me state. <laughs> right? that's, that's kind of what they're expecting, and Jesus comes in a very different spirit and attitude. And, um, and so they recognized in him if we want to say it this way, he had left their orbit. And so if it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, then their lack of grace toward him, we might say their lack of graciousness toward him, uh, this is all indicative of the very atmosphere I've been describing in the town. And recall this, that in Isaiah chapter 6, Verses 1 to 6, Isaiah the prophet had gone into the temple one day after the death of King Uzziah. And while he was in the temple, while he was praying, he saw a vision of God. He saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And when Isaiah the prophet, a man who was a legitimate prophet of God, when he saw the Lord, what did he say? Woe is me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips. This idea of a culture that was besotten with lack of honor, with uncouth talk, with unbelieving professions, all of this had happened more than once in Israel's past. It had at least happened in the time of Isaiah, in the time of Jonah after that, and ultimately in the time of Jesus. And we might suppose that perhaps in that era of time, maybe it was more common than less common that people lived in that culture of unbelief, that culture of dishonor. Maybe the only time that they really had um, revival was, for example, when Josiah led the reform, calling the people away from their idols, calling the people back to sexual purity, getting them to stop worshiping Baal <clears throat> and to tear down their high places. Maybe that was actually the unusual, the exception, and the norm was all of this stuff that I'm describing right now. And, like in that time, the conditions in our country today are indicative that we are not honoring the Lord, just like in Isaiah's time, just like in Jonah's time, just like in Jesus' time. All you need to do is look at the conversation that goes on in social media, and I'm going to include Christians. I look at the things that go up on my own social media pages that my staff has to take down. I look at the things that Christians say to one another. I look at the, as they say, no filters communication that goes on. 
or you look at the things that used to be censored by the FCC on primetime broadcast television that are allowed to go through in the name of entertainment or honesty, and you don't need to, you don't need to be a brilliant genius or a social commentator to see that the very indicia that were in place in Jesus' time are in place in our time. And as I said before, I'll say again, beware, because you might be tainted by it unwittingly. All right, the third thing that was problematic here is the people uh, in Jesus' town of Nazareth. They, they did not recognize or acknowledge the anointing that was upon him. He had to announce it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. In case you didn't know it. Now, if we did that, it'd sound very narcissistic, but of, of course, this is Jesus, so it's not narcissistic. But they had heard about him. They'd heard about what went on in Capernaum. They probably heard about the raising of that little girl just before he got to Nazareth. They knew, but they wouldn't acknowledge. They couldn't come to terms with that, that after centuries of God being silent, and of there being no miracles at all, those of you who are cessationists out there, I hope you're listening because I'm talking to you. After centuries of God being silent and of no miracles, suddenly there was word in the land that God was moving and that times were changing. And they remained entrenched in all of it. And so they disregarded the prophetic word he gave to them, that the spirit of the Lord was on him that he had been anointed to preach good news to the poor and that the blind were seeing and the lame were walking and even the dead were being raised. And so when they disregarded the prophetic word, maybe they did it because they didn't like the package it came in. They, they expected it hand out like the prophets of old, prophesying with the spirit of God upon them in great power. That's, that's one way to prophesy, it works, it's, it's real. But Jesus was reverting to something older. He was drawing upon the very written word of God. He was actually showing them from the scriptures themselves that this is the era you're in now. The kingdom of God has arrived for you and it's no holds barred. And so they couldn't receive the package. I think sometimes that's part of our problem in a culture of contempt and dishonor. And they were tempted to negate everything he said with a quip, physician, heal thyself. This was probably a common proverb of that day. Maybe Jesus overheard it, that's possible. Maybe he heard them muttering it just outside the synagogue. Maybe, maybe he had a word of knowledge and he knew it was going through their minds. There were times when he was in front of the Pharisees and he knew what they were thinking. So we don't know exactly how, but he certainly was aware they were saying, Physician, heal thyself. And so when Jesus explained that there had been previous prophets, Elijah and Elisha, who'd been sent to people who would believe the widow of Zarephath and Naaman the leper, when, when this had happened, they switched all the way from, mm, show me what you got, kid, to let's kill him. Let's just shut him up for good. Let's shut this down. Let's end all of this foolishness. No revival here. Thank you very much. That's what they tried to do. They tried to throw him off the cliff that Nazareth itself sat upon. And so with this, the people of Nazareth showed the ultimate dishonor. There was an endemic lack of familiarity with the person of the Holy Spirit and the ways of the Holy Spirit and how he might move because it had been a long time since there'd been a prophet in Israel and no one had ever seen anything quite like this. And they were so illiterate in the things of scripture that they didn't even know where to go to pull examples from the scripture to say, actually, this looks very much like what had been prophesied. And if you understand these three issues that were in play in Nazareth, and if you can, with a measure of detachment, lay them down upon your own life or that of your family or your church or your city or your state or your country. If you can do that, then you will very quickly come to the place where you recognize why 
in a nutshell, we see fewer miracles here in the U.S. than Tom is going to see in Zambia, Tom and the team. Or why Barb, I don't know where the others are, but I, I see you, so I'm picking on you. Rob and Katie? Oh, there we go, okay. Andrea and Randy? Out of town. Out of town, okay. Anyway, so you'll, you'll see why, whether it's Burning Man on the playa or it's over in Zambia or wherever it is, those people are going to go see something more. And sometimes people want to say, well, you know, it's all worldview. I think worldview matters, but I don't think it's the most important thing. I think this is the most important thing. And this is something that all of us need to look in our own hearts to understand. Well, back in COVID, I went to New York City and I, um, I did a conference there, led a conference. And um, <clears throat> we had... I don't know, it was like maybe 200, 250 people in this event <laughs> in COVID in a city where everybody had to wear masks, where you couldn't eat in a restaurant without a vaccine card, where you couldn't check into a hotel without a vaccine card. And uh, although it was interesting how many of the people who worked at hotel desks and in restaurants looked the other way and didn't ask you for your vaccine card. So that's how I got through all that. Uh, but anyway, I went to New York and I held a conference there and I literally cannot remember what I was preaching on. I don't even know what the conference was about. I'd have to go back through reams of notes and find, oh, they're, they're, those are the dates. Okay. But anyway, I did this conference, led this conference. We have all these people there. And as it worked out, because of the organization that was hosting this event, um, every person in the room was an Ivy League graduate. It was kind of the minimum ante to play because that ministry focuses on the Ivy League and students who come out of there and trying to lead them into churches and help them grow as disciples and so forth. Um, so you've got this room full of Ivy League grads and I got to the end of whatever this amazing message was that I was preaching that I can't remember. <laughs> and uh, and I, I said, now we're gonna have a ministry time and we're gonna have a mass deliverance. And I, I didn't know it at that moment, but, but I saw the, the organizer of the event, he was sitting kind of in the back over here to my left. I saw him lean over to the person next to him and he told me later, again, I didn't know this in that moment, but he told me later what he had said was, this is gonna be awesome. <laughs> and so I said, now all of you here have, um, have a problem. And, I, and again, I wasn't, this sermon didn't exist, I hadn't written it. Um, I was simply trying to respond to what I felt the Spirit of God was leading me to do. And I said, all of you here have a problem. I said, um, you're all Ivy League graduates and what you don't realize is that the lecterns and uh, the proper term for it is the tax turns, the kind of circular lecture halls of the Ivy League have become bully pulpits of unbelief. And no matter where you are in your faith journey, and most of them would have said they were Christians, I said, no matter where you are in your faith journey, um, you probably need to get free of some version or other of unbelief. And I said, so there are four things we are going to go after, four. The first one is atheism. This is the belief that God doesn't exist. And I said, now all of you here, I, I was giving them the benefit of the doubt, all of you here believe that there is a God or you wouldn't be at an event like this. But the problem is somewhere in the back of your mind, it's almost like a virus in the operating system of your computer, is this thing drawing off power from, from your computer and it, it tells you there really isn't a God. They told you this so long and so often in the Ivy League that, that you at times, maybe even often, struggle with the belief that God is real. But you keep up the outward appearances, you believe the propositional truths that we call theology, that God created the world and Jesus is his son and he died for your sins, rose from the dead, all of these things. You, you, would, you would mouth these truths, but in the back of your mind, in your quiet moments, you, you struggle with those thoughts. So that's category one, you, those of you who are closet atheists. Category two is similar but not the same, you're agnostics. You may believe that God exists, but you struggle to believe that he would speak to you or that he, his voice can be known or heard. Uh, you may struggle to know anything really about him, her, it, or them, depending on your own particular perspective. Now, please understand, 
I view God as a him, I'm an Orthodox Trinitarian. But I was speaking to a crowd that was diverse and well-educated, and for some of them, they would refer to God as a her, or an it, or even a them, if they were perhaps coming out of, say, a Hindu background or similar. So I was just trying to be a little bit inclusive in my language to them. So some of you are practical agnostics, even though you may not wear the moniker. Number three is skepticism. And skepticism is an unusual one, and I would say it's unique in Western culture. Uh, skepticism is essentially to say, I doubt anything anyone says unless and until I can confirm it myself. Now, I became very, very aware of this one uh, when I was doing a lot of work in Indonesia. I haven't been there now in several years. But uh, when I went to Indonesia, one of the things I found was that if someone was your friend, it's a very different environment than in the United States. If, if someone was your friend and they gave you food to eat, you were expected that you, you were expected to eat it. And similarly, if you had something to share with your friend and you gave it to them, they would take it readily and eat it. Now that may sound basic, but in the United States, if you give someone something to eat, they're gonna take it and look at it dubiously They might sniff it, take a little bit of a taste. Does this have gluten in it? I can't eat any gluten. I'm allergic to soy. Does this have soy? Because we're afraid that everyone's going to get the drop on us. We think everybody's after our money. This is my pitch on the tithing thing. <laughs> Just had to throw it out there. It's not in my notes. We think everyone's after our money. We think everybody's after us for sex. And with all of the scandals that have come about in the last couple of years, there's a lot of that one. Or they're after our daughter for sex. Or, God forbid, but even in today's society, our son. We're concerned that somebody's going to manipulate. They're going to try to become a cult leader, and there's virtually no trust left anywhere. It's not in the church. It's not even in families. Husbands and wives can hardly trust each other. Think about the conflicts you have in marriage, and think about how much of that is rooted in, I don't trust you. You say, well, if you knew what he was doing, you wouldn't trust him either. Okay, fair enough. Adjust your behavior and become a trustworthy person. But we live in a culture of skepticism. Do we trust our politicians? How many people here trust Joe Biden? Don't, put, don't answer that. Don't answer that. Don't answer that. We don't want Jeffrey to lose the tax-exempt status of the church. But, but you get the point, right? Or for that matter, maybe how many trust Donald Trump? That's a little riskier statement up here, but anyway. He's in hot water. So, so there, we've got skepticism running left, right, and center, and it affects our spirituality. I don't know if I trust the youth leader. I don't know if I trust my Bible study leader. How do I know? So we've got skepticism. And then the fourth one that I called out for those Ivy Leaguers was one that no one saw it coming, but I said Malthusian economics. And you're like, what? Thomas Malthus lived between 1766. Now remember, the American Revolution happened in 17. 76. So he's basically coterminous with the American Revolution. He was born 10 years ahead of it. And he died in 1834. He was a cleric. He was an Anglican clergyman. But he was also an economist, and he was a scholar who'd been influenced by a man named Adam Smith, who wrote one of the seminal works of modern economics called The Wealth of Nations. And he also was influenced by a Frenchman named Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who uh, was one of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment. Not to say I agree with what he wrote, but, but he was one of those people that when folks study that era, they have to study Rousseau. And Rousseau had written a book called On Inequality. Well, that sounds like something that could come right out of woke economic theory of the modern period. But anyway, um, Malthus read Adam Smith and Rousseau and... Um, so he was a leading thinker of the Enlightenment himself. And even though he was a cleric, uh, he was profoundly anti-Christian. And here's the thing, he wasn't an atheist because he was a cleric. 
and I specifically picked him as this illustration because I wanted you to see that this canon does exist in the church, even among leaders in the church. I specifically wanted you to see that. And Malthus wrote this at a time when the population of the earth uh, was just verging on a billion people total. By the way, today, the population of the earth is a little above eight billion. So eight times as many people today as were alive approximately 250 years ago. Thomas Malthus said the world is running out of resources. There isn't going to be enough. There isn't enough food. There aren't enough fish in the sea to feed all these people. We need to, do it. We need to engage in population control. That becomes the origin of what we call the ZPG or Zero Population Growth Movement. The thinking of Thomas Malthus is right at the center of everything it has to do with global warming. The thinking of Thomas Malthus is right at the ground zero of everything that goes with what we today call peak oil and the fact that there won't be enough oil. And on and on it goes. All of that is rooted in Malthusian economics. And when you think about the conversations that go on, whether in modern media of a mainstream type, ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, CNN, <coughs> Fox, or maybe on social media, or in the classrooms of America, or maybe even in some churches. I doubt you're hearing it here, not in this pulpit, knowing Jeffrey. But, but notwithstanding, I'm just saying this is kind of in the air and the water. You realize that Thomas Malthus is still alive and well, and though he is dead, he is still speaking. And a lot of us have come under that scarcity mentality, that poverty mentality, the idea that God can't deliver, that God won't provide. He, he doesn't own the cattle on a thousand hills, and indeed his arm is shortened such that he cannot save. And we live with that understanding of God. So these four things, atheism, agnosticism, skepticism, and Malthusian economics, this is what was over that room in New York City. And I called people to come forward, and we had three hours of heaven opening. All these doctors, all these city councilmen, senior partners from McKinsey and Goldman Sachs were on the floor vomiting out their guts getting delivered of mindsets, getting delivered of things that were in them because without realizing it, they had actually become modern day citizens of Nazareth while wearing the moniker of Christian. Well, about three hours into it, the um, janitorial staff kicked us out because in New York, you rent buildings literally by the minute and we had used up our allotment of time. So we were still dragging people out by their collars and kind of throwing them into the elevator to take them down to the street where we finished up what we were doing on the streets of New York. This literally happened. And uh, uh, about three weeks later, I get a phone call from uh, the New York Times. And this reporter said, I heard what happened in your meeting and I'd like to interview you. And I said, well, it depends on the terms under which we're going to talk. So we negotiated that up front. And she wrote up an article that I thought was in the end pretty fair-minded. And she said, I want to be honest with you. I don't know if my editor is going to let this go through. She said, this is pretty hot stuff. But, but anyway, I'm going to submit it and we'll see what happens. And about a week later, she called me and she said, I'm sorry. Um, my editor said, there is no way we can publish this. This will, this will upend the city if we release this story of Ivy League graduates getting delivered en masse of demons and their doctors and lawyers and city councilmen and partners in some of the most prestigious companies in the city. So that's why you never saw that article or heard about it. But this actually happened. Now, all of these things that I've just described atheism, agnosticism, skepticism, and Malthusian economics. These fall into the category of the stoike. This is a Greek word that Paul uses to describe the ruling spirits of the universe. Sometimes that term is translated, if you, if you read an NIV, it's going to use this language. Uh, but sometimes this, the term is translated the elementary principles. But let me assure you, these are more than principles. These are demonic spirits that spin out their demonic ideologies that infect people and infest their minds and draw them into living in their own version of Nazareth. And it saps their vitality and it keeps them from living the life that Jesus would have us to live. He said he came that we would have life and have it in abundance. 
He said, the works that I do, you also will do, and greater than these, because I go to the Father. These are the things which hold us back. By the way, Paul mentions these stoicheia, these elemental spirits of the universe, in four places in, the, uh, in his letters. Colossians 2.8 and 2.20, and then again in Galatians 4.3 and 4.8. But anyway, um, Paul goes on and he says that they propagate their teachings, but they enforce them through philosophy and empty deceit. I'm going to suggest to you that atheism, agnosticism, skepticism, and even the teachings of Thomas Mal Reverend Thomas Malthus, all of these things are philosophies of men. They are empty deceit, and they will constrain and constrict you from living in all that the Lord would have you to live in. They'll shut down a revival, too. And that's why we have to go after them. And Paul says their goal, Galatians 4.3, is to enslave people. Now, we're going to end the service here in nine minutes, and I'm done with the sermon. Uh, we're going to have a ministry time now, and so... Um, I've got a few people here that are ministry team. I've got some of you that are adjunct and auxiliary ministry team. And of course, the church has a ministry team. We may need most hands on deck because I dare say that in America today, most people need some ministry for one, at least one of these four things. Many need ministry for more than one. It takes a certain measure of humility, something that the people of Nazareth did not have in order to receive freedom from these kinds of mindsets and blockages to your spiritual growth. But if you're willing to come up and get prayer today, I believe the Lord will meet you, he will set you free, and perhaps this could be an inflection point in the life that you lead with Jesus, and maybe more broadly that this church leads with Jesus and the impact that you have on this region. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God, and we thank you for what is revealed in it. Lord, we thank you that even though Jesus did not find great favor in Nazareth, you opened other doors for him, and throughout the northern part of Israel and even down to Jerusalem, many breakthroughs came, and you continued working through your son. Father, we do not want to be Nazarenes, not in that sense. And so we ask today that you would open the heavens for anyone who comes forward, that there would be breakthrough, powerful prayer, and that people would be set free of whichever of atheism or agnosticism, skepticism, or Malthusian economics they may have fallen into. And with that, Lord, may we see great breakthrough and great advance for the rest of this year, for the rest of this decade, and for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.